Um, I'm Denise Melzerl, a professor in the, at the Wilson School in now the CPRE program. We are reorganizing a bit, so we're no longer just the Science, Technology, Environmental Policy program. We're the Center for Policy, Research, and Energy and Environment. The that program will continue as the educational component, but the research part will now be within CPRE. So the David Bradford seminar series is going to be in CPRE, and this is the second um, speaker we have this semester. I'm really delighted to welcome Professor Jason Wren, who's um, a new addition to Princeton as of this summer in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Endlinger Center for Energy and Environment. His research focuses on environmental bioengineering with special expertise in energy harvesting from waste streams and in broad areas linked to the water energy nexus. For those of you who may not be familiar with this idea, the water energy nexus refers to the linkages inherent in the use of water to obtain energy and the use of energy to extract and transport water. His lab analyzes reaction mechanisms and develops processes for energy, water, and resource recovery, and processes like wastewater treatment, environmental remediation, and water desalinization, which of course is extremely um, energy intensive. His goal is to expand environmental engineering from pollution cleanup to sustainable use of energy and environmental systems to enable a circular economy. Prior to joining Princeton, Jason was on the faculty at the University of Colorado Boulder and completed his PhD in environmental engineering at Penn State. Before that, he worked as an environmental engineer after graduating from Tianjin University in China. Thanks so much, Great Denise. Yep. Um, well, thanks so much, uh, Denise, for the invitation. It's uh, my first public lecture, actually, at Princeton. So uh, it's pretty exciting and uh, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here. Um, so. Um, Today, well, I was thinking about the topic, so I actually, um, I didn't really plan to talk about too much of the technical side of it, but really the broader uh, concept of water energy carbon nexus and uh, the concept of water resource recovery. Um, and uh, again, I have a, a joint appointment between CEE and the Ellinger Center, so that's something I could talk about, energy and the environment, right? So while you are eating, I ask you a question, like you are drinking water or tea, do you know how much water you would drink a day? Huh? Not much. A lot much, right? <laughs> Half gallon, a gallon, 10 gallons, <laughs> two point, two yeah. Yeah, so it's generally like we would drink about a gallon. I have a six uh, half liter bottle here just to represent that. But I did notice that uh, the climate and the uh, location changed a lot, right? Uh, when I was in Boulder, I actually drank a lot of water so in here. You didn't expect, for instance, it's still so wet and humid, right? Uh, but the next question is, like, do you know how much water you would use a day? In addition to drink it? A lot. A lot. Absolutely. More than that, right? So 10 times, 100 times. So the answer is about 100 times. So when you bypass a rack of bottled water, you say, oh, that's how much water I would use a day, right? And once, how, where would you use it? And there's many places you would use it, right? Uh, flushing, washing, showering, and you probably guess which one use the most water. <laughs> yeah, so when you talk about embedded water, that's true. So generally, would a flushing would a, um, actually use the most water, and all this water actually get to uh, a sewer system. You may not care anymore, and they get into a, what we call wastewater treatment plant. <laughs> Why I talk about this is that then you say, well, the water got treated by the plant and get back to the water body, right? And uh, that's right, everything will be fine. But I want to talk to you like a, a little bit background on this water utilization cycle that environmental engineers care a lot about, right? So what we, where do we get water? I don't know Princeton, but Boulder, we get water from crystal clear snow melt. So it's the best water source you can have ever. That's why there's tons of home brewers actually in Boulder area. So the beer is out of fresh water, right? So, um, so and then you may either also then the downstream uh, um, actually t towns would uh, get water from like rivers, reservoirs, groundwater, and other places, right? And then how the water got transported, it's going to pump up generally, maybe miles or hundreds of miles in certain cases, to a water treatment uh, system where it's got um, purified to remove the particles, pathogens, other things. Then it gets to, into a pressurized water distribution system. So that's why when you open up your faucet, um, your tap water can flow no matter which floor you are in. So that's actually um, uh, pressurized and clean. 
After you use it, the water gets into the wastewater treatment system. Again, there's a, a gravity flow into the uh, sewer system. And then there's a, in some towns, you have this water reuse system where you, ha you have advanced treatments like membranes, other things, uh, pipe it into purple line, purple pipe, if you have ever heard, um, seen those, for actually other non polyp and polyble reuses. Or you can actually discharge wet, um, the water back to the water source, and then the town actually downstream would be able to re-pump it up, reuse it, and retreat it, and, and do it. Uh, just to give you an example, by the time of the water, say Mississippi River, reached to the city of New Orleans, the water has been used by seven, eight times cycle, this cycle, seven to eight times. They also have good beer, just to let you know. Um, and, uh, <laughs> But one thing I want to highlight is this, um, this red. Anything red in here would cost energy. So that basically then you say, well, there are a lot of energy involved in moving the water, treating the water, you know, how much energy would it be used in water systems. This was a recent report by International Energy Agency, and they actually evaluated the global actually uh, energy use um, by water uh, systems. So it's about, like you say, uh, the dots actually represent percent. It's about 4% um, um, in the worldwide, um, how much uh, global electricity being used in water systems. And in the US, it's about the same. It's about 4%. But uh, in, and you can see actually in different sections in how much being used in transport, how much used in treatment, desal, distribution, and other things. But in many others, um, um, this, does, this only shows the average. But in some specific scenarios, water actually use a lot of more or less energy, depending where you are. For example, anybody from California? Nobody. I'm probably the, as west as you can imagine, <laughs> right? Uh, so California actually used 20% of its energy for water treatment and delivery. 20%. That's a huge amount of electricity used in California, not only because it's dry state, but because the, the pipes the, uh, actually has to go through the mountains, up and down, so the pumping energy, the transportation energy, um, actually significant. Uh, but so, and also another point I want to make here is really, for many towns, for example, maybe Princeton and the Boulder and other towns, wastewater treatment and wa drinking water treatment probably among the biggest energy consumers for, our, uh, for the town. So they use a lot of energy by itself on the local level as well. And uh, certainly you see the second bullet point overall, so even though our energy efficiency is going to increase, our water uh, saving uh, managers are going to improve, but certainly there will be still, due to population growth and other things, there will be more actually water use and more energy use. Then how about the other way around? We talk about a lot of energy being used in water system. How about the water use in energy system? You may see this, well, for if you visit any power plant, I know uh, Eric actually has, a, uh, has tours for his students who visit power plants. In many traditional thermal power plants, you probably see a big reservoir or lake nearby. Why? Because they use a lot of water for cooling and other processing, so they actually uh, the biggest withdrawal, uh, water withdrawal uh, industry. And they are actually also the second largest water uh, use uh, industry just right after agriculture, right? But you may surprise if I talk about like a the new energy sources. We talk about, for example, the fracking, the um, actually shale gas and oil development. They use a lot of water. They are, and also biofuels. Just to give you an example, I did uh, uh, some research years ago about actually dealing with water issues on uh, what we call conventional um, oil and gas exploration, when you do fracking. When you do hydraulic fracturing, each well you frack, you would need uh, like two to four million gallons of water. This is a fresh water pumped down to the ground to frack right, the shale formation, and 80% of that water is going to be lost. It lost in the uh, uh, hydrological cycle, so you cannot reuse it anymore. That's a total loss in our view, water utilization. And about 15 to 20 percent water gonna flow back, but it's no fresh water anymore. They got much dirty. They got picked up actually. Uh, they pick up like hydrocarbons. They pick up like a very high um, concentration of salts, metals, right? And that water is dirty. 
It's very hard and expensive to treat. That's why in many practice what they do, they inject this water back to a very deep ground wastewater disposal for a while, right? Something happens in Ohio, in Oklahoma, what happens? Earthquakes, right? So there's a lot of actually activity to say, is there any other technology to be able to reuse this water to actually really complete uh, uh, the water cycle? Another example I want to see is biofuels. We have 10% mandate of ethanol in any, gas, in any gasoline um, uh, station, right? And you may not realize actually ethanol industry and also biodiesel industry also very uh, water intensive. There were studies actually um, even like uh, t about 10 years ago really first raised alarm that when you look at how many zeros of, in terms of water use to generate one megawatt hour by the biofuel industry, you would be stunned. And this was again, this is the first generation biofuels out of, uh, corn, as, uh, out of corn or soybeans, right? And I'll give you a, a sort of a simple actually number you may be able to remember, like uh, to produce one gallon of ethanol out of <coughs> corn, for example, you would need about 500 to 4,000 gallons of water just to produce one gallon of ethanol. An even more astounding number is if you get this ethanol into your car for, to drive well, one mile, one mile using this ethanol, you actually consume about 50 gallons of water. So in terms of this, how water works in this industry, it does not work at all, right? So the industry actually has um, increased efficiency in water use, energy use, and other things actually dramatically recently. But really one thing, the biofuel industry is still very water unfriendly in a way that we need to uh, deal with. So in this summary, like I would say, well, then you can see energy industry also use a lot of water. So that comes to <laughs> this very complicated uh, Sankey diagram. I won't get into detail. But DOE actually had a very uh, comprehensive report a few years ago, back in 2014, under Secretary Moniz at the time, really to look at the interactions between water energy and also how do these systems interact with other systems like food, land, climate, and other things, right? And one example I can tell you, I was quite surprised in the two months I live in here, how wet it is in here, how much rain we got this year, right? And, uh, and then you see on the East Coast, all the hurricanes we have, so East Coast definitely getting wetter. And look at the West Coast, all the wildfires are getting drier. So the distribution become an issue as well. So I'm not a climate um, a scientist, but you actually can see and what, where are the renewable energies are. It's on the West, where the solar panels are, where the winds are. Well, we will talk about offshore actually on New Jersey coast just last uh, week. But they're really, uh, the water will be on the East and uh, energy on the West. I mean, how do we reconcile on that end? So, we talk about all these challenges so far. What are the opportunities? One opportunity I do um, as, a, as a, a researcher is to identify actually how do we actually recover energy and the product out of this water infrastructure. After all, I'm a water guy, right? You would have, if you categorize me. Um, but I'm the best energy guy in water, or the best water guy in energy in a way. But uh, I would have hoped I would have become that. But in a way, if you look at the, this is US data. For the water industry, we use a lot of water. And it's equivalent, I mean, the energy, equivalent to about 5.4 million household annual electricity use. And it emits CO2 associated with the fossil fuel use, right? And but on the other side, if you look at the number, the wastewater that we discharge contains about 10 times of energy embedded in the carbon then the energy we use to treat the water. I know it's a long sentence, but a simple actually calculation on that is, remember the 4%. We use about 4% of energy to treat the water, right? And 10 times of that, I would say probably not 10, but because wastewater use about 1.5%. Say 1.5% of wastewater actually use, uh, energy use for uh, treatment of the wastewater but if you actually, you can recover only a fraction of that, not even 10 times, like half that, that, five times, you're actually not only making the wastewater treatment energy neutral, you produce more energy to use to treat it, 
you actually can make it energy positive, like become a small power plant to a certain extent, right? And on the other side, I haven't talked about carbon yet. So I'll talk about carbon just in the next couple slides. You actually can use this large amount of wastewater for actually carbon capture and utilization and to convert it into energy and chemicals where you can make money. So that's a big deal uh, in my view in, uh, for water infrastructure. So that's how I've been working on. So the graph on the right basically is something we have been working on uh, with a group of people from government agencies and the academia industry to really also not only looking into how to convert waste streams to value streams, but also how do we integrate water infrastructure into other systems like uh, transportation, energy, food system, building systems, right? I mean, you may have a smartphone, you will get a smart car, you have smart home, all these gadgets you have. How about smart water to a certain extent, right? So they all connected to some extent. So that's water. And then to expand that, this is my personal view, okay? People may not carry the similar view. But my personal view is, yeah, so there's a, actually tons of wasted carbon, not in wastewater that we can recover for valorization. But there's many other waste carbons, like in our food. 90% of food waste that you, you, you throw away today would be end up in landfills, would not be actually recovered for any of the uh, valuable products. And uh, certainly there's a lot of carbon, 40 gigaton actually being emitted to the atmosphere. So overall, you'll say, well, if we can actually recover value out of this, what we call waste carbon, materials from gases, liquid, and uh, solid, we not only would be able to actually reduce our fossil fuel use, but be able also to actually probably mitigate some of the carbon that already in the atmosphere that I'll talk about some technology about that to actually contribute to uh, carbon capture, storage, um, sequestration, and uh, utilization. So that's something I have been working on uh, in the past few years. So I was involved in workshops, I organized workshops, and mainly with all these uh, different agencies. And a lot of reports came out uh, in the past couple of years, starting from the water energy. Then you can see all these agencies are really interested in actually converting this uh, waste carbon material. We talk about wet waste, which is liquid or some sort of high uh, uh, moisture content solid waste like food or gases, which basically uh, CO2 and methane, how to convert them into energy and uh, byproducts, right? And then you say, well, this is uh, like, it uh, sounds too big, but like, give me, uh, let me give you one specific example. New York City, probably have played with this website a lot. I love it a lot in my, uh, for my class uh, teaching. So this is a, a website, interactive. You actually can play what's happening when um, actually global tem uh, temperature rise, right? So this is the current state of uh, New York City and uh, uh, um, New Jersey. You can see that's our uh, seawater level right now. But if you actually see when the temperature rise by about 4 Celsius deg uh, uh, degree Celsius in about 40, 50 years, hopefully not, um, the seawater um, uh, level going to rise about uh, 29, 30 feet. And, uh, you see pretty much Manhattan and New York going to be underwater, and Princeton going to become a beachfront town to a certain extent, right? Um, in that case, I will say, well, that's really going to be a disaster uh, for us, especially the coastal uh, state, right? Then look at is there anything we can do, again, in my discipline, like uh, in, the, in the energy and the potential we have in wastewater. So now everything is in red uh, for a reason, right? So New York City, discharge about 1.3 billion gallon per day. 1.3 billion gallon per day, okay? And what they, how do they treat it is, again, it's actually consume about half billion kilowatt hour every year. It emits hundreds of thousands of uh, tons of CO2. It actually drains about half billion dollar from the budget. Certainly nobody wants to live, near, uh, live nearby a waste to sewage treatment plant because it smells, right? However, if you have like a policy, you have behavior, you have technological changes, you would convert it potentially to a different color. Um, you would be able to generate millions of um, a kilowatt hour in renewable energy. You can capture CO2, you actually can generate revenue, and everything will be capped. In terms of technological advancement, you will convert it into anaerobic 
So you don't have much smell um, um, actually um, uh, in adjacent area. So New York City is actually moving a little bit closer to this vision where it actually um, has plans to convert all the 14 wastewater treatment plants into zero energy by actually recovering uh, renewable energy out of uh, wastewater. All right. So, so far I talk about the broader in, uh, sort of uh, implications between water, energy, and carbon, right? Nexus is a buzzword. I just try to define it a little bit on my view. But uh, then I'll spend uh, maybe another 20 minutes talking about our own research. This may be a little bit more technological. So, in observing the nexus between carbon, energy, and water, our research focuses on understand and develop technologies uh, on this carbon electron cycle in the context of water energy nexus. And in the fundamental level, which I will not talk about too much today, would it be really understand the interface between biology and electrochemistry, where how would it actually be able to understand how bacteria work? How do we actually make them happy so they can convert more waste material into energy or fuels, right? And then we also develop materials for uh, best uh, energy production where you actually make, again, better attachment, better conversion efficiency, lower cost. And then we develop reactors. The engineering department develops a smaller reactor and a bigger reactor to scale it up to find really the, its niche in different applications. And then on the system level, we analyze where this technology is going to fit, where the potentials are, and other things. And certainly, I won't be able to do this with, by myself. I have a, um, a group of uh, students, postdocs, uh, to help me. Uh, they are the, really the hardworking um, lab mates. <laughs> and uh, they actually um, uh, are very productive and make uh, our group um, actually as productive in this research. And also, I want to acknowledge my um, uh, sponsors, not only from the government agencies, but from the foundation and the industry. All right. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, all of them are pretty, um, I would say, uh, um, um, wide and uh, uh, on the surface side. But if you have any more questions technologically, I'll be happy to, happy to discuss um, actually um, afterward. So one platform we use, this is a plat technology platform we use. It's called a microbial electrochemistry platform. It's on the interface between biology and electrochemistry. So it's maybe a pretty complicated graph, but I'm just to use an analogy. You are finished eating, right? What you just ate was your food, right? And where I do it, what your body is doing right now is exactly what bacteria we hope they do for us. Your body is degrading or oxidizing the food you just eat, and then convert it into energy, right? And electrons. That's why you are breathing. You are breathing in oxygen to take the electrons that were from your food and then reduce it to water so you would be able to complete the electron cycle. Everything is a cycle, very frankly. And so in that case, if I would install electrodes <laughs> in, any, in any actually, uh, <laughs> um, in, in, I'll say, uh, in your body, to be frank, I can steal electricity as well. Because it's all this electron flow actually in your body happening right now to actually gain your energy, right? What we do is basically steal electrons from bacteria. So we feed them their food, which is actually the organic waste in wastewater, or remediation, um, like hydrocarbon in soil, right? So they would attach on the electrode. You see those little guys? Those are little lab pads for us. And so they actually would um, actually um, eat up the wastewater or the waste organic carbon. And then they would transfer electrons not to oxygen, but to our electrode, we call anode. And certainly, we do a lot of uh, um, sort of uh, molecular microbiology uh, to understand them. And once you get uh, electrons, it's nothing different from solar or wind. You basically get renewable electrons, right? Then you can get these electrons to, say, for CO2 reduction to chemicals, or you split water for hydrogen, or you just directly generate electricity, right? So that's a sort of on the cathode side, on the right side. But then if you think it as a system, you basically create a microbial battery. It's a little battery over there where you actually have a negative side and you have positive uh, side, right? Then what you have? You have is an internal potential between the two sides, two electrodes. Then it, it actually would drive salt removal. Sodium is positive charge, 
chlorides and active charge, right? You can actually split salt, you get clean water. This is called a desalination. You can also actually uh, do ferti fertilizer recovery. For example, nitrogen and phosphorus, ammonium is positive charge, phosphate is negative charge, right? Pretty simple chemistry, but you can actually do this all together. One very simple example I want to show you, uh, this is probably uh, related to the mission of STEP, uh, it's really, um, this is a, a simple, actually, a device called microbial fuel cells. Like I see bacteria attach on the electrode, they actually transfer electrons, so you get electricity. So we made a little video, um, and uh, you can see actually we have this uh, artificial human waste in the reactor. You actually, if we say when you connect the circuit, you actually see the, the, uh, the fan was spinning. I'm just playing it again. Um, so you actually get real power. I'm not making it up, right? Um, so what we used for this one uh, was actually uh, founded by Bill Melinda Gates Foundation in their effort of reinvent the toilet. You probably have heard this a few years ago. And the mission was really can we actually not solving their energy problems, especially in developing countries, but also solving their sanitation problems. You know, one thing I say, well, why don't you just uh, install solar panels? I didn't know this before till I got into the product. Solar panels will be gone like a snap. You can, they can be resell for money, right? People won't need that renewable energy, they want money more. But on the other side, who's gonna steal our stuff? Nobody, <laughs> right? So that, that's actually a good catch on that. But also, in, um, in especially in, say, Uganda or some African countries, um, say, this uh, sanitation is not, a pub, not only a public health or sanitation issue, it's actually a social issue. Because girls and women don't want to go even to go to school because they don't want to public toilet with no privacy and with no security. So that's a big issue, especially at night. If we can actually generate maybe a little amount of electricity with lighting, ventilation, and some people actually even went further to actually have cell phone charger, you actually see, <laughs> that's very convenient, right? So you're actually not only treating their wastewater, but uh, also actually general energy and uh, um, um, actually uh, sec security to a certain extent. So, uh, we'll ta so certainly we've done uh, actually uh, uh, field testing in Uganda. Uh, we did generate um, uh, power out of uh, the toilets and uh, um, we were actually mentioned in the NPR story um, uh, during this uh, what they call Toilet Innovators um, Sanitation Fair. I won't tell you what uh, Bill was looking at but uh, um, uh, but I did, uh, we, we didn't win but I did get a good name it's called Poop to Power Professor, P3. So, uh, so if you listen to that uh, case, so actually that's my student called me at the time. Um, and then, uh, so um, other uh, project we've done on the application side, so Colorado had a lot of uh, hydraulic fracturing site and they generate a lot of wastewater. So as I mentioned, we actually, if you have three chamber system, you can treat the hydrocarbon, generate energy, and in the meantime, generate um, actually um, internal potential to drive salt removal, right? So you actually kind of have three, uh, stone, uh, three birds with one stone. Um, then you have, again, um, you can see the uh, salt removal, TDS stands for total dissolved solid. You can see uh, it got removed. COD stands for chemical oxygen demand. It's organic, you get removed. And even you can eyeball the fluorescence, you actually see most of the organics actually was gone. Uh, in the treatment, then we actually scale it up uh, to, um, on a trailer. We actually, um, uh, this is a pilot scale. You can see the water before and after treatment. Um, and you actually, a very interesting fact was we were able to generate a small amount of electricity, which is not a lot, but compared to the <coughs> competitors where they use a lot of electricity, uh, it is uh, still a, a milestone. Like you make it uh, energy neutral to a certain extent. Another example I want to say was this was a student-driven actually idea and product. My student actually, uh, Tyler Huggins, um, he's right there on the far right corner with uh, his buddy, uh, Justin. Uh, so th th they sort of found like this uh, high surface area of fungus called Neuspora. So they actually treat brewery wastewater a lot. So say the downside of the picture, you see the water before and after growth. Brewery wastewater, like beer wastewater, it's like chocolate for bacteria or fungus, okay? There's a lot of sugar in there. So they would be able to not only clean up the water, but they would be able to actually take up the nanoparticle of metal catalyst 
during their growth. And then when you actually grow them, you got water cleaned, you got this biomass, you can carbonize it by pyrolysis, then you actually have this metal catalyst embedded high surface, high surface area carbon material, which is a perfect candidate for battery. So they actually put it in a battery, it actually worked well as um, a compared to graphite. So it's a very interesting idea what they had, and uh, he got like um, a lot of money from DOE, the Zen Secretary Maniz actually gave them the word, and now they are really uh, running a, a startup company uh, called Emergy to hopefully commercialize um, this process. So I'll move to uh, another uh, um, idea like we had on the material side. Again, I don't spend a lot of time to really synthesize artificial material. We try to g learn from nature. I'm an environmental engineer, right? When, and then you try to solve environmental problem on the other side. So in one thing, say I'm from Colorado, if you visit Rocky Mountain National Park, sometimes you see this bronze bus. What that means is all these pine trees got killed by the beetles who were able to survive the winter in Colorado because of climate change to a certain extent, right? And then if you do not cut those trees, they become what? Fire hazards, right? So there's a lot of research going on uh, a few years ago to see how do we better utilize um, this, um, um, that trees. And certainly we work with um, a material scientist at uh, University of Maryland. So this is a kapok tree though, it's not a pine tree. We were able to actually carbonize those uh, wood material, make it um, um, actually lactose. It's actually hollow, so you can see the bacteria would grow inside and out. You double the surface area, you can get more uh, energy out. And then uh, we were able to act, take advantage of the water channels in the trees to make it a wood membrane. This is like a micron level uh, filtration filter. It's become a wood membrane filter. You actually not only to, you, to use it as a lactose, but as a filter. So you actually get a much better quality of that. A recent study on a material side is really getting into this uh, very popular area called of artificial photosynthesis. What artificial photosynthesis is that it's like a plant, right? Simulate plants where you do is you basically have renewable energy and you have water. Generally, people use clean water. And then you would split water into hydrogen and oxygen in two chambers. And then you use hydrogen to actually, um, and, uh, to, and CO2 in the atmosphere to synthesize organic chemicals. This is basically how plants do things or algae uh, or cyanobacteria do things. But people running into this issue very uh, specifically, if you look at this, um, generally like a, a lot of very expensive catalysts uh, cannot still do it. When you have oxygen, ox uh, oxygen um, high, uh, water oxidation to oxygen and the proton reduction to hydrogen, you have a actually voltage gap we call bias, um, about 1.23 volt. In order to overcome this gap, you need to apply either like a, a 3 to 4, uh, to 4 volt of uh, external voltage, or you need a two separate expensive catalysts. And a plus, you generate oxygen and hydrogen. Everybody knows what happens when they meet, right? It's going to explode, right? So, and a plus, you don't have clean water all the time, right? So what we did was very simple, actually, concept. We actually replaced the clean water with uh, wastewater. Then the actually bacteria will do the job as a biocatalyst to significantly reduce the what we call junction gap um, to actually oxidize organics. Now you only have a, about 0.23 volt uh, of difference. So you can use very cheap catalysts like silicate, black silicon to um, actually um, um, uh, channel the reaction. So I'll show you one. So this is a reactor where you have bacteria grow on the anode, sunlight on the cathode. I'll show you another um, video where you can see we really did not have any energy input. We have wastewater and we have the uh, sunlight actually to actually uh, just to get very high rate hydrogen production on that. And what's significant of this study, what I feel is, this is sort of material characterization I won't get into detail. This is sort of new material which was able to sustain the current at about 20 milliamp per uh, centimeter square using real, again, brewery wastewater. This is a record because if you have a photo catalyst, you'll see anything above 10 is very good, but many catalysts can get into above 10 
can only sustain about a couple minutes. They are not very stable, especially even in clean water condition. We were able to run this system hours and uh, double of the threshold current density, and also we use real waste. And the, as an environmental engineer, that's very significant. Because if you want to apply this, people would claim, well, whenever you have water and uh, energy, uh, sunlight, you can actually get your renewable energy, which may not be very practical in developing countries because they even do not have clean water. They're struggling with their clean water, right? But however, whenever there's people, there's wastewater. You're actually not only producing the energy, but you actually clean up the wastewater. So that's sort of one thing I feel very um, interested, um, interesting. Then like I'll talk about the system level, um, work with uh, Greg Rao, who is a first author and uh, has a way out at the uh, um, Naval Research Lab. So we look at the hydro global hydrogen potential, where the um, hydrogen can be um, produced from all these renewable energy sources. We talk about solar, wind, geothermal, or even bioenergy. And what will be the global CO2 removal potential out of this uh, treatment process, as well as uh, the energy generation potential by hydrogen? And I found it's uh, hydrogen can be actually a viable, uh, I would say, option for uh, renewable energy and uh, CO2 mitigation. Then, say, we'll talk about uh, water and energy mostly so far. How about the carbon? Can we do more in actually wastewater industry for carbon um, actually utilization? So forget about very complicated cross chemistry, just to focus on this equation, where you have, we can actually divide this microbial electrolysis carbon capture process, where you get about two more of, a, say, organic carbon in wastewater. You can capture four additional more of CO2, and then generate about six more of calcium carbonate, which is a mineral that you can use for, say, construction materials, and certainly very high rate hydrogen. So, and in that case, the efficiency was pretty good. You got about 80, 90 percent of the conversion. And with that, we were thinking, well, what are the potential? We understand the scale, right? Whether this is promising or not, if we would replace the traditional wastewater treatment by actually uh, replacing very energy intensive process, anaerobic, anoxic, aerobic sediment, uh, sedimentation process with a, a, a sort of a new process is the, our microbial electrolysis carbon capture to deal with organic carbon and capture CO2 and the microalgae system uh, where you actually deal with the nutrients like the nitrogen and phosphorus. And we came up uh, uh, with actually pretty good numbers that uh, were very interesting where say the conventional treatments actually do get uh, direct and indirect greenhouse gas emissions the new system would be able to um, actually cap, um, not only not emitting net greenhouse gas, but also to capture about two, three times of the greenhouse gas that uh, uh, was emitted. So it's really, uh, in one thing, is actually have additional benefits of capturing the external source of uh, CO2. And certainly they will cost more, right? This is a, um, actually an economic study. But uh, they would be able to generate, again, as a product energy to offset the cost and uh, uh, to generate a net revenue. Then we'll think as an engineer, where can we use this? Well, you actually can see there are common co-locations between a carbon emitter, like a power plant, like uh, Denver, New York City, and uh, refineries, right? They have also big carbon emitters at uh, 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 wastewater treatment plant. So if you would be able just the low hanging fruit to actually couple them together, they're already together, right? You would be able to take their waste co-ash wastewater CO2 to treat it using the wastewater uh, process to also generate energy like hydrogen and actually material like calcium carbonate. You actually purify the co-ash as well. So in summary on this end, um, I would say we really try to um, have the industry, especially the water industry, to rethink how do we actually um, uh, change the practice of this industry. It's a very heavily regulated industry. It moves very slowly. But the, a lot of people start to recognize the potential over here to not only will do our traditional job to remove the contaminants, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, but we'll be able to recover energy nutrients and uh, capture CO2 and reuse the water. So the benefit is real, right? So this is again, it's very rough data. Um, I don't really, I cannot, um, I don't want to publish this in a peer review article because we had to do more that deep an analysis.
But the rough estimates in the United States, there are tens of billions of dollars in potential, not only to actually generate economic value, but also solve a lot of environmental and energy problems, right? So that's really the um, water, energy, and nexus side of it. And then I'll spend the next uh, probably four minutes talk about something else that we do um, just on the side, a similar concept. Uh, so we have been uh, really um, supported by Sharon to look at the oil spill cleanups and uh, underground storage uh, tank cleanups. This is like a two, more than two million actually underground gasoline storage tanks, diesel storage tanks leaking this pollutants into the adjacent area. So don't buy a house actually very close to a gas station. This may not be a very good idea. And what we are doing, we use this, um, again, bioelectrochemical systems uh, to actually clean up the gasoline. And we scale it up from lab scale to actually pilot scale. And Sharon got um, uh, uh, quite interested that so they are really looking into uh, do more actually field testing, hopefully to apply it uh, in uh, many sites that uh, they have. And then on the fundamental level, we, this is very busy slides, you don't, uh, so very sort of a, a simple um, explanation of the slides is we try to look at uh, uh, what are the bacterial community structures in the system and what are they doing in the, say, the complex soil system. Where you see the green dots in the heat map, uh, the uh, TPH, uh, total petroleum hydrocarbon degrading bacteria, Right, the ones, the electroactive bacteria, they can generate current, right? So what we found is they are actually coexist and they work each other very um, hard. It's generated this centrific activity where the lines are not high waste or spatial distance. Each of the lines connecting the two dots are a metabolic pathway. What that means is um, they have metabolic interaction. For example, a simple example is one bacteria would actually say degrade hydrocarbon, then they will have waste products for themselves, like uh, fatty acids, alcohol, other things. The other bacteria will pick up their waste and uh, as their substrate and uh, producing current, right? So there's many actually metabolic interactions between the bacteria in that case. So this is the interaction with biology. Another interaction we have a lot is with electrical engineering, because you deal with energy all the time, right? So how do we actually develop power electronic circuits to actually maximize the potential of the, the bacteria um, um, energy harvesting? You can actually want to get higher power sometimes. You will get higher current sometimes. So we, divide, we work with the electrical engineers to develop power circuiting to actually basically, again, I'm not a, uh, really a circuit guy, but really to use this system to actually boost the performance of our system. For example, this is the voltage on the, on the axis, uh, Y is the current. You actually see from red 60 days, 90 days, and 100 days, you actually see the current increase with the po po potential shifts lower. What that means is we are training and we are selecting the bacterial body. For the most protective bacteria that we want, they will survive and they will thrive. They will actually get actually uh, much more actually uh, active in that case. But on the other side, the other bacteria that we do not want, say they are not very productive in say converting current and they are totally got separated. So these are different uh, actually circle represents bacteria initially all together when you inoculate them and then they got separated when you operate them in different scenarios. So that's actually the molecular biology connection with uh, electrochemistry. All right, this is my last slide. I just uh, actually came up with this yesterday. Because I use the first line a lot in my class. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. And uh, this was about 200 years ago written by uh, Sir uh, Coleridge uh, in the poem. When he looked at the mariners, like uh, they see like in the ocean, saline water everywhere. But they couldn't drink it, right? They don't have, they need fresh water, right? So that's how actually desperate they are in the time. I grew up in China, so that picture is very familiar as with me when I was little. You actually see there was no water infrastructure. People would drink very poison, or I mean poison or actually contaminating water. But as a water engineer, there's a lot of actually um, progress 
to actually deal with water problem, sanitation problem. You would actually, see, for example, people develop these filters that would be able to filtrate pathogens and other things to treat water. So I was thinking just yesterday, um, I got to get a smart line for this seminar, right? <laughs> so I came up with this. For all the carbon issues we have, whether it's a gas or a way, uh, uh, solid or uh, water, can we actually do carbon, carbon everywhere, so far, nor anymore to use. But how about we change it? <laughs> All right, so that will conclude my presentation, and I welcome any questions. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know where to focus my attention, but I know it's very interesting, very innovative. But I was, I was attached to a very small thing you said. You said you were, it's one of the first projects you were stealing electrons. I understand you're stealing electrons to use them. But those electrons were doing something else with them. Exactly. So, so how do you deal with that? I mean, how do you deal with what is lost? Something is lost. OK, so you eat a, like a three slides of pizza, and you feel, oh, I got to go on treadmills, right? you burn out your, really, the energy you got in. For bacteria, it's the same thing. They actually, what they want to do, they to eat as much as they can. Not the people would do that all the time. But they, 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 for storage, for a rainy day, right? Sometimes they may not have bad food at all, right? What we are doing is, like, we would uh, nudge them. We will use this electronic system to actually take electrons from them. So in sometimes in win-win situation, we got extra electrons. And they got fit, right? So fitness, right? But in other time, if we take more electrons, they will die. So I have to confess, there's a tricky balance, but that's the interesting part of the research we do. How does it, I, I wasn't quite sure how the process actually works. I mean, it's obviously chemical. You got, a, you got your microorganisms. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you get? How do you steal the electrons and recover them somewhere else? Is it just what are you? What are you adding? Um, we did not really add anything. We just uh, make them um, say, for example, um, you will think this: my bacteria as a whole community are very diverse, right? And these bacteria are quite unique, but they are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. You can get it from uh, your backyard. You can get it from sewage. And these bacteria, what they do in nature, they would uh, respair. They don't respair oxygen. They generally respare metal oxide, like iron oxide or metal or magnesium oxide. And they say, what we do as when we breathe, we take oxygen inside, right? Dissolve oxygen into our uh, blood, right? And then the oxygen got reduced. It's a little sort of chemistry, right? These bacteria do different things. They, do, they cannot take a rock inside, or they cannot take an electrode inside. They do something very unique called extracellular electron transfer. They will give the electron outside of their cells. They actually produce, there's a, a lot of biology research, they say they produce these wires, uh, pili, what they call They are conductive sometimes. And the bacteria will take these electrons from food, wastewater, they will deliver the electrons to a surface where it would be our electrode. And they have to do that because that's their oxygen. If they don't do that, they will be able to breathe. To, re to do the cycle. So that's basically you take advantage of the nature, natural selection in our case. And there are certain genetic man uh, manipulation of these bacteria, say GL bacteria, Shrinala type of bacteria, to do it um, um, uh, sort of um, uh, synthetic biology way um, to actually make them do better job. Yeah. We, we deal, as an environment engineer, we deal with natural bacteria. Yeah, you can basically you have a circuit. It's a fairly straightforward. It's very similar as a, like other electro, like a solar or other thing. You have converters, and then you have a, like a load, like resistor or a capacitor or a rechargeable battery, to, and you actually can store those electrons. Uh, but I guess what I gather is that you don't introduce your favorite bacteria to these reactors. You just use what happens to be there. Yeah, absolutely. As so the what environment. Kind of bacteria are there? Um, yeah, so the bacteria generally would self-select uh, by themselves when you create the right condition. Yeah. 
it's sort of evolutionary selection in a shorter period of time. Bacteria would be able to breathe the electrode, would survive. Bacteria would not be able to have any function in this system, would disappear. So. Well, what I suspect is that if you have a bacteriologist study, you might you could use the existing kinds of bacteria you might import into your system. Absolutely, it there's. Be better than the native one. Yeah. Um, Yes, uh, it's a called a bio augmentation. So uh, people are doing that um, in many environmental systems where you basically can introduce the good bacteria, for sure. But uh, one thing I'm reluctant to do is genetic manipulated bacteria, because they may, we don't know the consequence when you release to the environment that uh, something we do not know much. Yeah. So one way to capture energy from water is uh -huh. to generate methane and capture the methane. Yep. So yep. That's a good question. That's a good engineering question. So, um, so anaerobic digestion is a century-old technology, and they produce biogas out of um, any, many organic waste materials. And it has been used in, um, again, smaller like household or bigger um, like waste or treatment plants. The issue of anaerobic digestion is not about the technology itself. It's relatively mature is the value you create, is the complexity of operation. Uh, anaerobic digesters probably have the most complex microbial community in any environmental, engineered environmental system. It's much more complicated than beer brewery, and uh, I don't know about farms, but other things. Um, and also another issue is a product, is biogas. How cheap nitro gas is, right? And the biogas is even cheaper because it has all sulfide and other things. It has all these contaminants. So biogas cannot sell for profit. So there's many actually other factors associated with the technology environment. For, for the thing this platform can do is it more versatile. It can produce much higher actually valued chemicals. For example, I work with the National Renewable Energy Lab. They would be able to produce butanol or butadiene, which is like much more marketable than biogas itself. So you would, uh, again, you still deal with the environmental problem, but you also have market driver. If you don't have a market driver, it's very hard to commercialize the technology, right? So to scale up the technology as well. Another thing is you have to find a niche industry. For example, say why I didn't really focus too much on, I didn't mention municipal wastewater, right? Because industry would be willing to pay much more in treating their wastewater, for example, brewery, for example, oil and gas. All your gas companies are willing to pay 10 times of the technology to treat their water than municipalities. So that's where actually the market is. You have to understand it. So in terms of actually where the technology go, where the niche markets are. So that's sort of the things is also in play with the technology as well. Yes. Uh -huh. the and the maximum power output is rather suspicious. One of your graphs shows milliwatts per meter square. Well, that's a very small amount of energy and probably less than required to pump the gases into the cells. That's a very good point. So the energy we generated, like I always emphasize, the small amount of energy we generated is not about the electricity we generated. So we did generate electricity, look at the Uganda example, the Gates Foundation example, right? You would be able to actually condition the power. For example, you don't need a continuous power. Say our lighting are sensor powered, right? I mean, a, sens a, a sensor, right? In a way, like I say, when there's people in the toilet, the light are gonna be on. When pe there are no people, still charging, right? So you would be able to have this thing to actually condition the power output. But you know, more thing that what I'm focusing on is really on the, not on the power, because I do agree with you, it's very small power we generate, rather the electrons. The electrons we generate can be used in many chemical processes that we can produce much more valuable chemicals. So similar problem as solar and wind. In the West, actually, we got too many actually renewable electrons from solar and wind. You probably have heard the dark curve, right? 
So there's so many renewable electron storage and transportation have become issues, right? So that's really one thing I try to avoid and go into the more profitable products. Uh, we do not need any power to run the system, so the bacteria will do itself. Yep. I, you do need a pump. I mean, I have to admit, but you have to pump that anyway. It's a, the boundaries you, you use actually to treat and to pump are two different things in our calculation, right? Transport of water and a treat water. If you think of pumping energy, yes, I would recognize, yes, pumping needs a lot of energy. And the energy we produce may not offset pumping. So I would, I would acknowledge that. Um, but in a way, I'm trying to just uh, directly answer your question, how much voltage we get. I'm trying to get that. All right. So this is the typical uh, graph on the voltage, right? So you basically get with you how maximum power is multiply voltage with current, right? You got about a watt per meter square, right? Right there. That's a very typical lab system where you can get. And the current we can get the highest about, about a couple amps per meter square as well. So that's uh, the bio system, um, basically, what you can get. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, thank you.